Uh, okay, so thank you. Uh, what I want to ask is, in terms of responding to the urban context, uh, visually a lot of Charles building would be fairly modern, I would say. So straight lines or curvy lines, uh, a bit of and not the same as you know the context in which usually you design it, like in Lima, where a lot of demand. Uh, uh, Kampung houses, which is also here, also Kampung houses. But what I see is that it blends it nicely. So in terms of, we are also going to decide in a heritage spot. Uh, but how do we like explore visually an identity that is not necessarily the same or reflects the surroundings, but it still fits in nicely. So although Charles buildings are not necessarily the same as Kampung houses or directly reflected, I think that it. The way I see it, it fits in nicely to the context of the way it's a box in the middle of like pitch roofs, for instance. Uh, how do you make that, you know, uh, adjustments visually towards the designs? Yeah, thank you. Okay, I must confess. Um, I mean, this is not the first time. A similar question was asked, so they asked us if this is Indonesian design, if this is tropical design, and because it's you know, clean cut lines and, and whatever. Um, we're, we're very interested in the context, but more into the, the community, and maybe the social fabric. We're interested in the context of the climate, you know. Meaning, uh, we want to have cross ventilation, of shading, we want to avoid the building heating up. Uh, we are also yeah, interested in, 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 in the functional, so the synergies, so a lot of programs are there. However, I must confess, um, we don't use so much traditional architecture, especially not directly, you know. So what we, what we do is maybe there's a construction principle which is interesting, maybe there's a material which is interesting, um, but we always transform that into, into contemporary and, and modern language. And um, yeah, because, you know, personally I must, I, I also think like, we need to take care of a lot of things, but you also as an architect have your per personal preferences. And this is simply our personal preference and our taste. And, you know, I don't want to make pitched roofs just because they're pitched roofs a lot, you know. So, um, and I don't think it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a problem in a context in, in Bandung at all. Because, so first of all, you know, they're also contextual, before I go into this point, they're also contextual in terms of their massing. You know, they're not bigger, or, you know, it's not all of a sudden there comes this, this, this big piece and it's totally out of scale. So there are in this scale. But then again, if you look in a Kampu situation, or in, in a situation in Bandung, and if you look at the street, to say it's entirely pitched roof and traditional is also, you're also not doing City because what we have in Indonesia is this huge eclecticism of all sorts of styles and anything goes next to anything, right? Yes. So, in that sense, I could even argue that we're, by not obliging ourselves to a traditional pitched roof style, uh, we are as contextual as any building. Because, you know, sometimes you have a building that also has maybe a pitched roof behind, but it has a straight wall in front of it. It's like a flat roof, it's painted blue or yellow and has a big uh, telecom advertisement hanging out. Know? <laughs> so how is such a building is, is, is as contextual or not contextual as, as our buildings, right? So, um, you know, I, what I'm very fascinated when I'm driving around in Indonesia, and I see sometimes buildings which actually have quite a good design, just at least from my perspective, 
if there would be you know, better maintained. So modern design, designed probably not by an architect, but by a layman or a contractor, but you look at it and I think like, it's actually quite an interesting building. Detailing would have been a little bit better, a bit better taking care of the building. It would be actually quite an interesting piece of architecture. So there are these hidden pearls somewhere, these um, you know, elements of, of architectural expression in Indonesia, which sometimes are extremely modern and sometimes are extremely traditional or in between, but you know, a lot of different things go. So, I mean, as you have this book, Learning from Las Vegas, maybe you should make a book learning from Bandung or learning from Jakarta, you know, because you, know, you have um, you have this modernist um, office building, and the ground floor is the restaurant, and what do they do? They attach these traditional roofs only on the ground floor. I mean, wow, it's uh, it's very daring, you know, to <laughs> to mix this two together, you know, but anything goes. I mean, I saw a villa in, in, in Jakarta, which is in a Greek style, also a classicistic style, but completely painted golden. I mean, <laughs> of course this is not architecture, but you know, that happens, that happens too, and then it is allowed that it happens. So, in that sense, I'm not so much worried if we are architectural language-wise 100% fitting. Does that answer the question? Oh yeah, yeah go ahead. So thank you. Maybe as an sorry, sorry. Uh, maybe as an additional question regarding that. So although like anything goes with anything in Bandung, are there any like advice that you give us in terms of designing? So uh, you mentioned an example of having scale as an important thing, so you are not out of place in terms of scale. But is there any considerations that you make, whether it's in BIMA, library, or any other context in which, although the actual architectural language is different, but it's it's still, because what I see is, although anything goes anything in Bandung, Shell's buildings, specifically, I think, still fits in my scene. So, is there any advice for us uh, when we are designing? So, for instance, we're designing in Asia, Africa, and with all the heritage buildings surrounding. So, although we want to make a modern uh, building, a contemporary design, how do we make it fit in? Or, or is fitting in, in the end not that important? Thanks. Look, the thing is, of course, first of all, if you deal with the con context or the urban context in terms of building heritage, is firstly to evaluate how valuable it is. So of course I portrayed now sort of the extreme case where the anything goes context, which is sort of the everyday situation, I would say like 90%. And of course now if you talk about Jalan Afri As uh, Asia Africa or Jalan uh, uh, Praga, you know, where there are heritage buildings, of course you need to take a little bit different care. Uh, so is this how is the state of the building? You know, is it still very well maintained? Does it have mostly the original details, or did over the years somebody come and change all the walls, change all the ceilings, so nothing is there left anymore anyway? So, what is the state of preservation of the actual building you're surrounded with? and you may be touching or you may be intersecting with or dealing with. Because if there was no respect before, you know, then and, and nobody of the original clients and owners took care of this building to maintain it in a certain state. You now if you have the, the cassette ceiling, uh, all the wooden elements is 20 times overpainted, you don't see anything anymore of the original details because nobody took care or they just made a Slot the a wall, drill into the original tiles or whatever to, to place the wall. If there was complete disrespect for this building, uh, then you need to ask yourself, okay, do I um, bring it back to its original state? 
can I do this? Do I want this? Or do I say, because you treated the building anyway bad and you didn't care about its historical value, so I do not care about that neither. Uh, this, in the end of the day, this is your decision, uh, or your part of your evaluation. But what I also would like to add is, um, what you need to take into consideration is about heritage, is if you want to preserve something, what, how do you decide what time in history is exactly the moment which you like to preserve or go back to? As an example, if you take um, castles in Europe or I don't know what, right? So they start out maybe medieval times and Renaissance times or whatever. These castles were changed and adopted and so on and so forth. So which time in history, if you would like to renovate it or go back, which time in history do you choose to pick? To say that's the right moment I want to go back and erase all the other history of it. So I think this is very interesting to analyze when you have a old building, a heritage building, to also analyze what the building went through in terms of change, in terms of usage, what was added, what was removed. So what is the history of the building? To understand the history of the building. Because in the end what you're doing is just a continuation of, of the history. So if you say, okay, we go back to let's say, for instance, a moment how the Dutch have built it, you know, um, then you erase all the other history. You could do that maybe in the case of a building in Chalant Praga because it's not like a thousand year old, but only a hundred year old, and say the intentional use was a cinema, and then over the years it still was a cinema, but was done sloppily, let's bring the cinema back to its original state because there you don't erase so much of history. However, let's say, hypothetically, right, this cinema was used in the beginning as a cinema and later became uh, an important place where people were gathering in uh, post-war Indonesia and it played a major role in uh, sort of, yeah, the new republic. Right? So they didn't have money back then, but they used it as a meeting place and an office. Would you erase, even though it's done in a bad way, and sloppily because they didn't have the financial means and they continue to do so, would you erase that? Probably not, because it's an important part. So then you have like the, the juxtaposition of the original design Dutch architects being architecturally valuable versus the historical value of the building as it plays a role within your own history. Uh, now there's the question how you will interfere with that. And now going, um, now trying to give an advice in terms of architectural invention, I think um, you can blend contemporary elements with historical elements without a problem. I mean, I remember some, like again, old castles, you know, where only the crumbled walls and the ruins were there, and not the voids were filled with, um, with glass, for instance, or the voids were filled with, um, with concrete. So, you completed this building in its old volumetric appearance, but with new materials. But still materials which are fitting, let's say, with it was stone and you use raw concrete, it's still, it's still matching, right? But you fill it up. Uh, in Munich, there's a building, it's a um, Pinakothek, and uh, the other Pinakothek, the old Pinakothek, it was bombed during the Second World War. Um, so it was, uh, if I have to, Put now the, the, the style on probably some classicistic style, but what they did is after the bombing, they renovated the building, they took the old stones they found there and filled it up again, but not with all the details and all the ornaments, but just filled it 
not a landed baron to sort of document that this building is now back in its original volumetric appearance and form, but to show the scars which happened during the bombing towards the building. So uh, I think because with that, so you repair the building, but you leave the history of the building intact. So in that sense, I would argue you can fill in whatever you need to problematically <coughs> with respect to the history of the building rather than maybe the building itself only necessarily. And then again, um, like within any architectural project, the matter of composition, how you arrange new volumes versus the old volumes, what spaces in between you generate, how they complement each other, what sort of comp composition you will arrive at, is of course a similar architectural task as if you would design, let's say, three new buildings and how you place them versus each other. Okay? <coughs> Uh, any other question? Mm -hmm. I don't think it's so long. Uh, so my question actually is more about the people. As you mentioned in the first in your first presentation, um, you mentioned that a space, a co-working space especially, is not just about putting tables or making a room where people can interact, but you also have to um, more in order to make it a community. And right now our task is to make a community center. Yeah. So my, my question is that as an architecture student who has not had an experience um, designing the real world or having our buildings built, how do we take into account um, the activities of the people and you know make our buildings more lively? so that it becomes an actual community center, not just a building that, you know, as an object. How do we treat buildings as more like something that's alive? Okay, um, now my question would be to you. What is the community? Yes. <laughs> uh, so tell me about the community. So, well, well, I, um, according to my understanding, the community is where people Usually the same, the same goal, purpose, gather, and then they interact and discuss and usually end up doing something productive. Yeah, okay. But the specific community you have to design for? Identify a certain community over there, and, and you know, 
go there, look around, keep your eyes open, start documenting and talk with people and then um, prepare a questionnaire. And with that you can generate a, you know, a community center. And I think the recipe for any community center is, is pretty similar. Not just need to identify which community it is you want to design for and what in addition would they like to have and need and how could you, you know, make this a lively place. types of designers or students I met in my life. They're the ones <clears throat> who make a lot of research and analyze and overanalyze and overanalyze and then I never come to a conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> and, then I, and then they're so lost in their own data that they don't know what to do anymore. So you have to make sort of a leap of faith, you know. So at a certain moment you just need to jump, you know, when you feel like now, don't overanalyze, because otherwise you, you don't see your path anymore, you get totally lost. So analyze to a certain degree until the moment you feel like it inspires you, it triggers something creative. When you have this, then start designing. And don't go further, because then you just start overanalyzing and you don't know what to do anymore. You know? And then there are other students, you know, who don't analyze and just design, and it's also not the right way of doing it. But don't overthink it, you know. Don't turn the problem 20 million times around in your head. Because then you get 20 million angles and you try, then you're confused and then you don't know where to go anymore. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? we have like the Hindu Buddhist area, we have the Islamic influence and we have the Dutch colonial area where you know it's the central square in the city where the martial court is, formal hearing, but it's also cultural and festival and, and, and gathering in a way. So I mean it was always a place for, for festivals and, and military and representation of power and assembling people together, you know. Assembling people together, it's almost like a container where, because all the people are standing there, they're celebrating the same thing or wearing the same uniform, they have this very big feeling of we, not I as an individual, but feeling the community. So as long as soon as you put all these people together. So this is actually the role in a way of the Alan Alan, the, 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 the city square, to enable people to feel this um, togetherness, to feel like 
they're gathering for a greater cause. And of course we have that in the post-colonial area, era too, with uh, the Independence Day ceremony and uh, all sorts of other gatherings. But we were thinking, what can we do with that nowadays? Because, you know, in the end of the day, it is only a square where you once a year or twice a year gather and stand and do the uh, appeal in front of the, the flag. Um, we feel it's a little bit, I mean, it's still necessary, but we feel it's a little bit, you know, you should be able to do something with the space during the rest of the time, too. And this is basically a little bit the background for the Alan Alan Chichendu in Bandung, which in a way is also a multifunctional space. It's not just an open field with a flagpole where you, where you stand there. So uh, the site itself is 5,000 square meter. Um, you see it's um, along this crossing with the roundabout in the center, um, Chalan Aruna, Chalan Arjuna. It's a very prominent spot because it's directly attached to this roundabout. So it's, it's very visible. It's really on this on the street corner, it's visually sticking out. So the whole neighborhood is a neighborhood with a lot of kiosk for um, steel. Uh, welding work, selling spare parts, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's basically the, the steel neighborhood. And uh, so that was the, the, the previous situation. And what you see is the land itself and behind is a sort of dump yard or storage or undefined. Uh, but basically it's an open place which is not utilized. So because it's location, because it sticks out there, it could potentially become much more. Um, at the same time, you see, that's, that's a general problem in Indonesia, that uh, we have very little pedestrian uh, sidewalks. And if we have them, we have to be careful not to fall in a manhole in a canal down there. <laughs> or have to step up 50 centimeters. Um, because everybody is, as soon as there is something not legally defined, not spatially 100% defined, it gets immediately occupied. And probably started with a little steel workshop here and a little steel workshop there. And the economic rule, in a way, is, you know, uh, there was also once a teacher of mine asking me in an urban uh, design class, was asking me, if you have a neighborhood which has 20 bakeries in the street, what are you going to build? We all thought, like, yeah, bakery, maybe they need some meat to put on there, whatever. The answer is no. We built a 21st bakery. We built, again, a bakery. Why? Because the whole area is known for bakeries, and people go to this area for buying bread and nothing else. So if you make a tourist office or whatever, it won't work. So if you have this bakery area, of course you have 20 competitors, but the synergetic effect of people coming there only for bikeries is higher than the negative effect of having all the competition. And something like this happened in, in this area, most probably too, meaning you know, it became known for steel workshops, and now it's a steel workshop, steel area. It's where the area is known for. But, so all these little workshops, of course, um, yeah, are essential for the identity of the area and are essential and, and, and economical essential part for people living there to make their money. However, in terms of you know people walking, everybody in safety, everybody walks on the street, and, and having a connection to a park, an entrance, they cannot stay there. So you need, in a way, to clean up the street. And uh, I think a very smart thing in the design brief by Rivan Kamel was that when we design this park, we need to get rid of them from the street side because we need a pavement, we need a proper entrance, we need also the people give a possibility to walk past the street, but we need to reallocate them inside the park. That was one of the design tasks because otherwise people just go bonkers and uh, will demonstrate and feel they are like kicked out, so we have to accommodate them. And this is also something 
things are far for me interesting because this is some, something I only encounter maybe for the first time in my life in Indonesia. Because in Europe, we would simply make a park, we re reallocate them somewhere else, whatever. But since people here are so sort of rooted in their neighborhood because they live around the corner, they have their friends there, you cannot just allocate them somewhere else. So we have to find a solution within the site. So therefore, actually, this uh, Alun Alun Chichendu is not just an Alun Alun, it's a multifunctional space because we need to accommodate these people too. And this is a new typology I would argue you probably never see in Europe. I and mean, then you have a park in Europe or you have a square, but it's all like relatively monofunctional because maybe yeah, I can buy some snacks, but that's it. Here, we make the park and these people are also in Park for having their, their little workshop stores. So as a second aspect, um, so Ivan Kamel made a sketch which pretty much looked like this uh, sketch on the on the left side, which is very very zoned, uh, very separate um, elements. You know, you have the circle that you enter, then you have a sort of pathway going up, and then you have like these planting boxes. You usually know in the in the common, you have the other in the middle. But we said like okay, um, you know maybe rather than make everything sewn and chopped down into different actual functions, we would like to have it much more merged or much more fluid or much more gradual changing one from one thing to the other thing. So you know, instead of having now everything only here, and this is this zone, and that, that is that zone, and you know, have it all allocated, like really sort of a multifunctional space where you walk through and it sort of gradually changes from one to the other, of like here is uh, Steel Town, and here is whatever, Migoreng Town, and so on and so forth. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so, now we came up with that design. Um, and um, yeah, I mean it's it's red steel, it's rusted steel. It's not cortain because cortain steel is too expensive uh, for the budget for, for the project also in Indonesia. So basically, it's, it's, it's steel plates which were treated with acid, and then they start to corrode, and then there was another layer of uh, clear coating to stop from further corroding. But of course, this is is very ob ob uh, obvious that steel with the neighborhood was the building material that we want to use because it immediately relates to what's going on in the neighborhood and during construction you can hire the people there. So people who are there can work there to maybe get some extra income during the time of the production. And that is also again part of the placemaking. This is part of the identity and part of the ownership of how people regard this spot. Because you know, we went there when it was open, and there was a guy hanging out uh, with his wife on a, on a Saturday or on a Sunday, and he came to us, ah, you are the architect. And he was so proud that he was working on this uh, uh, project. So by making people able to contribute something, in this case, construction, they start owning the project. They said they're, they're becoming proud of it. You know, so this is also very important with, with public space, this ownership, because if people feel like they co-own it in whatever way, then they treat the place better, with little less sense on and so forth. So, um, yeah, still as a, a, a relationship to the neighborhood as a main building. Material. So, and then um, in terms of, of um, sort of language, uh, we wanted to have something more organic and less rigid, and uh, with this gradual change, also you know more fluent, more the idea of browsing and guiding the people rather than um, defining things too clearly. Sort of the exploration idea. So. We wanted to animate the people to start walking through the park. That you arrive there and you see like, okay, this is this area, this is this area. I've seen it, I've done it, I don't need to go there because I see it already. 
by sort of different heights and making visual hurdles and making visual obstacles and maybe something peeking out around the corner, making people curious to start exploring. And uh, also in terms of height, so because I mean, a lot of parks and a lot of Taman uh, Islands are flat, so we uh, made this stepped stairs. That first of all, people walk up, then they have this upper deck there, um, which is above the deck above the, the, the steel kiosks, which are underneath. But you know, activating the people, giving them different heights, different viewpoints going up, going down, to stimulate them to explore. This was the whole idea about this landscape. And of course, in a way, the landscape itself, with its sort of topography, lands itself very well to Bandung as too, because Bandung, in a way, is not a flat thing. So it is, becomes, in a way, contextual, I could say, or you could ex explain it easily to people why we made these steps apart from sitting and walking and animating people for walking. Also to say like okay, you know, look at Bandung. Bandung is very hilly and has all this wonderful landscape. So we transform this idea of the Bandung landscape into something maybe more abstract, more geometric, but nonetheless relate itself a bit to um, topography. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of functions, and they were asked also in, in the brief. So the skate park, the art market, meeting point. We were asked to design a kiosk. Uh, Blacksmith kiosk, parking area, uh, sort of a viewing platform. I think the, the sand area we came up with and uh, the canyon area we also came up with for the kids. So the sand area was the idea of we make a quiet space, people can sit there and uh, just sort of not, not really meditate but something more quiet. Um, we completely failed in that one because <laughs> Nobody knows what a sand area is, but they saw all the pebbles, pe all the pebble stones, and people starting taking off their shoes and walk around, so it becomes a reflexology. <laughs> but good, I mean, we learned something for, for the next time. Uh, the canyon area with the water, of course, was always thought for the kids, and when there is water inside, it also works because the kids are just hopping around. So, um, Something what we are very proud of, in a way, is then also that the park fulfills some educational, maybe not on the foreground, or maybe not that strongly, but it has also some educational purpose. Because we have six local artists from Bandung um, making sculptures and displaying sculptures there. So it becomes immediately an outdoor museum. Maybe it's not so obvious to the people straight away, but this is part uh, of also a sort of a, a, a public education. So you expose people who never ever go into the museum ever in their life looking at art and sculptures, you expose them automatically with the park towards arts. So the uh, secondary or tertiary purpose of this stepping landscape is that you can place the art pieces on top of it. So it becomes almost like a pedestal in a museum. Everybody sees these art pieces and we also think because if you look at Instagram, uh, a lot of people take photos and tell with this art piece. They also work as attractors. So they make also motivate people to go to the park to climb up and, and look at this stuff uh, a little bit closer. Um, yeah, this is a section, so a different material, materiality. So we didn't want to be this other other two. Uh, closed off, too much sealed, because if you just make a concrete floor, it will get super hot. Uh, with using grass block or grass stone, also water can go into the ground. Um, we wish to have a little bit more trees, but you know, usually in Alun Alun is always an open space for, for, for gathering. But we probably will get a little bit more trees now, because you know, a lot of people go there and you need shading, people need to sit underneath trees, because otherwise you just get crazy from the heat. So. But um, yeah, different different uh, material selection with exposed concrete, um, this uh, plastic timber deck, uh, pebbles. So all we choose materials which we think are, are quite durable and are quite um, yeah, the contractor is able to handle them and the contractor is able to make them. But also 
in a way, color and texture-wise fitting together. Because also another uh, reason why we choose to have this rusted steel uh, instead of something shiny or glossy is that we know that it will be a public contractor and we have no control over the contractor and the, and the quality. And if you would make something shiny, you know, you would immediately see if something is shiny and if it's not done very well, you immediately see the imperfection. But using a rough surface and deciding to have a rough look, it's much more forgiving in terms of, of, of appearance if, you know, if, if the quality is not 100% there where you want it. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, now you see here, this is the, the other one. Hmm? No, it's done. That's how it looks. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, in the foreground, you see the upper deck. Uh, the trees are now a little bit bigger, so you see the trees are peeking out. And, um, yeah, all these landscape elements, uh, sports, the pavilion. So I just uh, walk you through there. But, you know, again, um, the most important thing is um, apart from, from, from uh, not apart, not just the architecture, but what people do. So what we started to do is also collect a lot of photos of their activities, what they're doing on, uh, from Instagram. Because it's really interesting to see and watch what people are doing there. I mean, apart from the stuff you plan, I mean, obviously a basketball field, you play basketball. But if you go in there, uh, at an actual Saturday or Sunday, and you see the, the the use of the space, you can learn tremendously a lot for that, and you can use this for your next project to actively design with this. And what I mean by that is, uh, for instance, the pavement, right? So for us in Europe, it's pretty much standard to have a pavement, but uh, for Indonesia, it isn't. So all of a sudden, you know, because we have this white pavement and kids or people on this pavement are relatively protected, they're starting renting out these uh, little electrical scooters, which you usually have in shopping malls, you know, and all these kids go up and down the pavement uh, without the parents needing to worry that they get smashed by a motorcycle, you know. And the pavement is even, you know, you can even, you can even ride there. So in a way, uh, yeah, all of a sudden, you generate some income source, which we were totally unaware of that that will happen. So we just found it out later. Or we designed these benches, you know, and they were loosely standing there. And everybody was just taking these benches and rearranging them, making tunnels for the kids, or the kids made themselves. So uh, it, was, it was very nice to see. And actually, that made me think, or made us think, actually, we should have put in much more playground facilities. But also, the, the point of urban furniture, all of a sudden, was playground furniture, and people start using it differently, uh, was very fascinating for us. However, if you look on the other picture, the city is not so fascinated by that thing, and they tie them all down with cable binders. I, I really like this way right now because every time you come, uh, it looks somehow differently. You know, it's just like there's a snake here, and all of a sudden there's a snake there. So very nice. Um, yeah, then the, the water element. Um, but since it's such a place which is so highly frequented, you find really a lot of different uses. So um, like here, you know. On one hand, you have uh, people using it for fashion photography or for pre-wedding photos, you know, making this really nice setting and really, you know, composing it. But then on the other hand, you have the snake show where... Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's, it's really amazing. So, I mean, these are things like which are completely unplanned from our side. So, but, uh, yeah, also the pavilion is a very photogenic spot, it seems like. People like to take a lot of photos with it, and um, yeah. So, in a way, also this is also a message I would like to give you. You can think about the community, and um, you will do your best in the world. 
but you cannot think about every eventuality and what will actually happen. So a lot of things are also up to chance, you know. But what you can do is, after you completed the project, you can go there and watch people and see what they're actually doing with it, and then flip it around and maybe apply it as a design strategy in one of your next designs. Uh, so also very interesting to see their the opinions. So uh, people write on Google. Um, the cool breeze in the area creates an experience you will never want to leave. Good place to chat with friends, let the children play. Happiness is cheap. So you know this is also because we made it maybe this sort of more walled towards the side. So it creates an inside versus an outside. It blocks a little bit the rest from the city out, not completely. But with that, you feel like you have an overview and you feel like, okay, my kids are protected when they run around because they run around in the center and they're not getting completely, completely lost. Uh, yeah, prayer room is closed due to unavailable water. <laughs> But um, so it's also very interesting is is uh, people asking how much is the entry fee? The answer is gratis. You only need two thousand uh, rupiah for parking. You know? So uh, yeah, it's nice to see. It's good to see that people like this place, and uh, it already has a local name. I think it's Taman Bajan or something. You know, steel, steel park. And uh, you know this guy, um, he got all this. Photo, so we asked him because the drone flying community was using this space a lot for making making photos. So one of these guys, uh, we asked him if we could use his photos. Of course, we credit him. Uh, Multi Salman is his way, so it's also from the previous photos here. Uh, but you can use his photos for 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 publications too. So there's all this this drone community flying around there. So, yes, this was the final project. And uh, uh, baik, ada, uh, tapi ini masih ada jam 11 kurang sedikit. Uh, ya, 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 ya. Karena ada apa, uh, Pak Asin pergi dan karena Pak Florian lagi diambil Pak Florian di SAPPK jadi masih butuh waktu uh, sebelum acara ini ditutup nunggu <laughs> ada yang saya mau bertanya tadi uh, Valens dan Ilham pertanyaan bagus uh, Asisi ya? kamu punya ya sekarang? ini uh, Indonesia atau Inggris? Inggris, oke Inggris Okay, first, uh, my, my name is Rino. You can call me Rino or Franz, whatever. Uh, uh, so, my question is uh, Is there any process uh, how Xiao learns from the past project for the the next upcoming project. Like for example, uh, uh, I I know that now you handle so much micro library projects. That do you do you learn anything from the Bima project that is can be used for the next project, like in the another city, like in the Ponte Like kind of like that. Thank you. Um. Yeah, I think I tried to explain it um, in the beginning already, but maybe it came out. Across, across clearly, but um, now what we learned from the Dima library is that it is essential to find a place where already a community is active or it's used by people, because it's no use to place a micro library where no people are in the first place. And the second thing is what we learned as a lesson is the people using the place. Um, very specifically, you should not change that usage. So in Dima it was the stage, and was the football, so you need to keep that intact. 
because that's the reason why the people come in the first place. And if you want to benefit from these people coming, you can only add or enhance, but you cannot get rid of these elements people are coming in the first place. This is super important. And these are this, uh, yeah, two lessons we learned. And the third lesson is, um, they are, you need to make this building a little bit special. That becomes also a little bit iconic in the neighborhood. It starts to represent the neighborhood. And people are proud and talking about it. So these are this, 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 this three elements. Use a space which is frequented. Don't change this, the nature of the space or the use of the space by the people. Because otherwise you lose them. And add value, build up on that. And then give them an interesting building. Uh, but I cannot speak about it. And exactly this we applied to uh, exactly this we applied for instance uh, to the hanging gardens microbiology. This is the lesson we learned that is already completely applied just with a completely different design and different building. But the core design approach is still, is still the same. Um, what else we learned, for instance, from Taman Phil? Um, we have this carpet, this artificial grass underneath the seating landscape. So I, I guess you know Taman Phil underneath the Pasupati. So people there take care of the space because they regard it as an urban living room. They regard it because it has this big TV, it has the seating, it has the carpet. They take off their shoes. Kids are rolling around. So, and it's a comfortable space because, you know, it's shaded, it's, it's rainproof. So, really, it becomes like their outdoor living room, in a way. So, if you want to reproduce something like this, you have to take care about the materiality. Um, meaning, I would, I would argue that this sort of carpet is stimulating people to take off their shoes, and as soon as they take off their shoes, it is regarded as an indoor space, not as an outdoor space anymore, and they go litter. But of course, you need to fulfill other requirements too, which is you know the roof and the shade and the, the protection from the rain. I'm not sure if people take off their, their shoes at the other oven. I think so too, right? They also take off their shoes they remove the carpet. So materiality in combination with the local culture can improve the use of the space and the maintenance of the space because people are not throwing their rubbish everywhere. In comparison to a normal park, if you go to Lancia or whatever, the amount of dirt and rubbish you see there is completely different than in the common field. So, make people take off their shoes. <laughs> Sand gardens don't work. Um, <laughs> reflexology gardens do work. <laughs> yeah. Somebody else? Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Alfred. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, I see that uh, many show projects have tried to uh, combine multiple issues and also respond to them by building a single building. Uh, for example, the one in uh, Kiara Tondo, which you guys are trying to uh, involve urban farming into the micro library. And my question would be, uh, where does the idea uh, derive from? Uh, I mean, uh, did you guys just uh, observe uh, what are these particular area needs and try to get you know, what what should be done with it or uh, are you actually involved with people that live in the surrounding area? Thank you. Um, yes, we, we it goes two ways, you know. So it's it's not entirely a participatory project or um, 
So, like I said, it goes in two ways. So, basically, the decision to have a micro library in this area was a top down decision by the mayor. What we did is we were scouting out different locations and said, like, okay, this is, in our opinion, is the best location, and gave the great advice to the mayor, and then the decision was taken. So, and um, the point in terms of, of, of the community, um, no, we did not listen so much to people there in terms of do we want to do urban farming or not. That became more a proposal from our side. Because, you know, it, it, sometimes you discover things during the design process and think, okay, this is a good idea. And then you test it and, and try to find the right people for it too, rather than only listening to people and then making something for them, you also can flip it around. And that happened with this uh, urban farming. Because um, you now with the design of this stepping elements, we had this idea actually we could use them as a planter box, because it would be nice to have a, a more green surrounding, uh, good for the water management uh, to have water stored in the soil, which is evaporating. It would be good for the microclimate around and also in the building. But then, in a certain moment, we felt like actually it would be really interesting if it's not just green, or if the green could even perform more than only something a climatic aspect and, and, a, and a green aspect. So we felt like okay, maybe we can find. Uh, farming community, which we then did and start talking with them, and you know now they're on board. Of course, at the end of the day, it needs to prove that it is working. But I mean, so far I don't have any 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 doubts. So sometimes you just throw an idea to people and ask them if they're interested to pick it up, and that also sometimes happens. So you you can do it from both sides. You know, you make your analysis, you talk with people, you listen to them, but then you can also, you should be free to also provide your own ideas and, and, and bring your own thing in. It's not like entirely wait till they tell you something, you know. Is it answered? Afri, uh, I would ask about uh, have you found any uh, unplanned result of your public space? I mean, uh, in in context of bad result <coughs> of your public space. Yes, um, I'll I'll just I mean, the, the kiosk, because we had to make them relatively dense, you know, the stalls are in, in two rows and forming two corridors underneath uh, the public deck, even though, you know, there comes light down, but uh, I heard some biker gangs or somebody or like motorcycle gangs were beating each other up there because it's a little bit secluded, so yeah. That is also a, a negative effect which can happen. How do you respond to it? Yeah, how do I respond to it? Um, it's a very difficult thing because, in one way, uh, if you want to make things dense, you know, then you need to pack it together. And as soon as you pack something together, it naturally, is is less open. But uh, for sure, what I will do the next time, think about it, how to make it visually more open. That Nobody can hide and start mugging or beating each other up, right? So that there is more eyes on on, on the spot that I would make different, and maybe more lighting that it's not becoming dark in the night and things like like that. So it prevents this sort of secluded spaces where bad things can happen. <laughs> Somebody else?
I also appreciate with the uh, apa, with the student who asked the question. Very very good question. Saya belajar banyak dari pertanyaan pertanyaan anda itu dan uh, sebelum diakhiri uh, ada ini ya uh, ada dari uh, Pak Asif yang uh, attend di sini. Yes, go with uh, Mas Guru uh, Surabaya.